the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men, looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God. Titus 2, 11 through 13. The salvation of all is certainly a blessed, amazing, magnificent, grand, wondrous, awe-inspiring, and glorious hope that brings glory to our great God. Let us begin at the close of our Lord's earthly ministry, the night of His arrest. His whole life had led up to this climactic moment. He knew exactly what was to befall Him, John 18.4. In the midst of a time like this, please reflect on the cry of His heart. Lifting up His eyes to heaven, He said, Father, the hour has come. Holy Father, keep them in Your name, that they may be one even as we are one that they may all be one, that the world may believe that they may be one, that they may be perfected in unity, so that the world may know that you sent me. John 17, 1, 11, and 21 through 23. Just think of it. Our Lord could have been completely paralyzed with fear, with only his execution in mind. On the contrary, his thoughts did not dwell on himself but instead on all humanity. His heart went out to the whole world. And what does the world need? To witness Christians loving one another, walking in unity. The world has yet to see it. It is my conviction that the blessed hope has the potential to tear down the highest walls that have divided believers over the centuries and restore the fullness of joy into the hearts of God's people. You greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory. 1 Peter 1, eight. Then the world will believe. Then the world will know who sent Christ and why. At that time, Jesus answered and said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and prudent and have revealed them to babes. Matthew 11.24 and 25. See also 1 Corinthians 1, 26 through 29 I am grateful that the discovery of God's truth is not the exclusive domain of the religious elite. In this passage, God has hidden things pertaining to His judgments from the wise and has revealed them to babes. Oh, that we would all be babes. Many babes today, I believe, long for the day when the dark cloud veiling God's judgments is lifted from the church. Oh, what joy, peace, and unity of purpose will envelop His body on that day. Then the world will know Jesus Christ is Lord. John 17:23. This is the glory of the blessed hope I cherish. Reason. God expects us to think through what we believe and not to simply accept what men teach. Christ commands us to judge for ourselves what is right. Luke 12:57. Paul exhorts us to test all things. 1 Thessalonians 5.21, and to judge for ourselves what he says. 1 Corinthians 10.15. From the outset of biblical revelation, we are challenged to think for ourselves. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? Genesis 18.25. Does not such a question require thinking? Our Lord always expected his hearers to think. What do you think, Simon? Matthew 17.25. What do you think? If a man has a hundred sheep, Matthew 18.12, what do you think? A man had two sons, Matthew 21.28. What do you think about the Christ, Matthew 22.42? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your father, Matthew 7.11? Call to mind the Bereans who searched the scriptures daily to find out whether the words preached to them were so, Acts 17.11. They are said to have been more noble-minded, New American Standard. We have been endowed with great reasoning powers, and God expects us to use them. He even invites us to reason with Him. Come, let us reason together, says the Lord, Isaiah 118. It is our very capacity to reason that enables us to love and be like God. Our hell tradition goes against all reason. In response to this, some will quote Isaiah 55, 8. His thoughts are not our thoughts, and his ways are not our ways. By this they are inferring man's reasoning is flawed, 
What we think is cruel and unjust is really not. If this be true, then we are not made in His image and have nothing in common with God. It would be impossible to reason with Him on any level. But is this what Isaiah meant? If you check the context, you will see that his thoughts are different than ours in relation to mercy, not cruelty. What a travesty such a wondrous passage has been twisted out of context to say the very opposite about God. This is a prime example of invalidating the Word of God for the sake of tradition. Matthew 15.6 A tradition fostering a fear toward God taught by the commandment of men. Isaiah 29.13 Though man a thinking being is defined, few use the great prerogative of mind. How few think justly of the thinking few, how many never think, who think they do. Jane Taylor How can a good God create creatures he knows will be tormented forever? There are two views. There is the prevalent view that this is the price God had to pay to get a few into heaven. The second view is the blessed hope. He does not face this dilemma at all, but reconciles all to himself in the fullness of time. Which most glorifies the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ? Which conforms to an all-knowing, all-powerful, and all-loving Creator? How can we believe God is good, while at the same time believe infinite penalty is the lot of most of humanity? We cannot unless we have a perverted sense of what good is, or we do not believe God has the power to prevent it, or we have not thought long and hard enough about the horror of what infinite penalty entails. However, if we believe God is good, in the normal sense, and His penalties are finite and just, there are no conflicting issues. This is the theology of the New Testament, the early church, and a remnant of believers throughout the centuries since. It is a theology that honors God, satisfies both reason and God's moral witness in each heart, and best harmonizes the scriptures. This is the blessed hope. Power versus love, or power and love. I look at it simply. Jesus said we must receive the kingdom of God as a child. Mark 10.15 If one and one equals two, it cannot be three. The following two points add up to a final glorious outcome and not a tragic one. A. God is all-powerful and always accomplishes His will. Calvinist Reform Theology B. God loves all people and wills the reconciliation of everyone. Arminian Theology, that of most Christians. Since he wills the reconciliation of all and has all power necessary to accomplish his will, is it too much to believe he will accomplish it? For if he does not, which part of the equation is flawed, A or B? Calvinists say B is flawed, while Arminians say A is flawed. But if we accept A as the Calvinists do and B as the Arminians do, then we would, like a child, conclude that every person must ultimately be reconciled. This is the blessed hope. The key to unlock the mystery, as I see it, is that Calvinists are right about God's power, and Arminians are right about His love. The tragedy is that both adhere to Augustine's theory of judgment, which forces them to reject or explain away the glorious side of each other's theology. But if instead they both embraced the blessed hope, they would become one, and the world would soon know Jesus Christ is Lord. John 13.35, 17.21 and 23. There would be nothing to reject or explain away. The greatest theological controversy and division in the body of Christ would vanish. Might this not be the key to set the captives free, harmonize the scriptures of judgment and mercy for all, and unite the body of Christ? Which of these three views comprehends the width and length and depth and height of Christ's love, and does justice to his unlimited power? Ephesians 3, 18 and 19. Which most glorifies God? Paradigm Shift 
How can Christ be considered greater than Adam? If Adam's transgression has greater power to condemn, then Christ's merit and sacrifice has the power to save. Have you ever considered this enigma? Please stop a moment and think about this. This is important. If you are facing perplexing and disturbing questions in your faith, perhaps your conception, paradigm of God, is flawed. How we understand God's nature and character, as reflected in His grand plan for humanity, affects how we understand the world and directly affects how we interpret the Scriptures. If your I, conception of God, is false, your whole body, being, will be full of darkness. Matthew 6.23 As I held the Arminian view of God, I wrestled with this for months and finally concluded that salvation had to be the work of God. I had made a paradigm shift. I began to understand God's power in the way our Calvinist and Reformed brethren do. I continued joyfully in this new perspective for about two years, until I no longer found comfort in my personal salvation. How could I, in the midst of a world of lost people? Living in a Muslim nation deeply affected me. It prepared me to consider a third paradigm, the blessed hope. Most people are not aware of how powerfully their conception of God affects how they understand the Scriptures. It forces them to conclude that certain passages cannot mean what they seem to say. For example, for as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. 1 Corinthians 15.22 My previous conception of God had forced me to limit the scope of the second all to a few only. My present view of God no longer limits it. However, it has not been easy seeing passages differently than how I have always seen them. I was conditioned for so long to see them in a certain way. But once the veil started to lift, I began seeing Scripture without the filter of an eternal hell. I was free to receive God's revelation in a fresh, new way. What a discovery! Let us embrace the paradigm that truly honors, magnifies, and glorifies God. We should not be surprised that the predominant view has been the hard and cruel dogma of Augustine. It conforms to the legalistic, hard, and cruel sides of our fallen nature. Man's tendency has always been to amplify what seems to be the hard side of God, and our tradition reflects that. It blinds us from seeing God's true nature in mercy and judgment. I pray God will open your heart and mind to the paradigm worthy of His name. What is meant by salvation? What does believing in Jesus save us from? In Repentance and Salvation, Robert Wilkin, Executive Director of the Grace Evangelical Society, stated, It would be difficult to find a concept which is richer and more varied in meaning than the biblical concept of salvation. The breadth of salvation is so sweeping and its intended aim so magnificent that in many contexts the words used defy precise definition. Joseph Dillow, Th.D., Dallas Theological Seminary, and author of The Reign of the Servant Kings, explained, Salvation is a broad term. It commonly means to make whole, to sanctify, to endure victoriously, or to be delivered from some general trouble or difficulty. Without question, the common knee-jerk reaction which assumes that salvation always has eternal deliverance in view has seriously compromised the ability of many to objectively discern what the New Testament writers intended to teach. In A Generous Orthodoxy, Brian McLaren, founding pastor of Cedar Ridge Community Church in Baltimore and author of Finding Faith and other titles, wrote, In the Bible, save means rescue or heal. It emphatically does not automatically mean save from hell or give eternal life after death. Its meaning varies from passage to passage, but in general, in any context, save means get out of trouble. In order to better understand salvation, we need to get a broad overview of what Christ came to do for us. He came to give rest. Matthew 11.28 Heal the brokenhearted, free the captives and oppressed, and give sight to the blind. Luke 4.18 Comfort the mourning, 
Give beauty for ashes, joy for mourning, and a garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. Isaiah 61, 2 and 3. Save from sin and turn from iniquity. Micah 7, 19, Matthew 1, 21, Acts 3, 26, Romans 11, 26. Save from God's passionate displeasure, wrath, and just recompense of sinful conduct. Romans 5, 9. Set free from sin. Romans 6.22 Rescue from this present evil age. Galatians 1.4, New American Standard. Bring hope and God to the hopeless and godless. Ephesians 2.12 Redeem from every lawless deed and purify us. Titus 2.11-15, New American Standard. Set free those who all their lives were enslaved to the fear of death. Hebrews 2.14-15 and 15. Redeem from aimless conduct. 1 Peter 1, 18-19 Model compassion for the distressed and dispirited, and igniting our hearts to pray for laborers in the harvest. Matthew 9, 36-38, New American Standard If salvation is deliverance from eternal woe, why the emphasis on temporal deliverances? These passages speak of deliverance from being heavy laden, blindness, brokenheartedness, sorrow, mourning, heaviness of spirit, hopelessness, impurity, fear of death, aimless conduct, weariness, being distressed and dispirited, lawless deeds, sin, and their consequences, the present evil age. How can Scripture emphasize these comparatively insignificant temporal pains in the face of infinite pain? For life on earth is but a vapor. James 4.14 And then we are hurled into eternal woe? How could James say pure religion is to visit orphans and widows? James 1.27 What a waste of time when we could be snatching the masses from hell. Why does Scripture not place the emphasis where it ought to be? Why the smoke screens? The only answer making sense to me is that a flawed view of judgment has distorted the significance and scope of God's salvation. Salvation's Purpose Having an idea of what we are saved from, we must now consider what we are saved unto. C.S. Lewis, 20th century British teacher and prolific writer, understood the purpose of salvation. He wrote, Every Christian is to become a little Christ. The whole purpose of becoming a Christian is simply nothing else. Scripture reveals salvation to be a process as much as it is an event. It goes beyond a new birth experience. Consider these. Warn that we may present everyone perfect in Christ. Colossians 1.28 Warn against what? Boldness in the day of judgment, because we are like Him. 1 John 4.17 Christians facing judgment? Work out salvation. Philippians 2, 12 and 13, salvation by works, shall be saved by his life. Romans 5, 10, shall be saved? I thought we were saved already. Take heed, in doing you will save yourself. 1 Timothy 4, 16, saved by doing? Save yourself? How are such expressions reconciled with Paul's teaching on salvation by grace? They refer to salvation's made-complete dimension, Colossians 1.28, the end goal of our salvation. Salvation always depends completely on the work of Christ on the cross. But we must understand that God is going somewhere with our salvation. We are predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son, Romans 8.29. We shall be like Him, 1 John 3.2 till we all come in the unity of the faith unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Ephesians 4.13, King James Version. Galatians 4.19. Reconciliation, Romans 5.10, is not salvation in that sense, but refers to what God has already done in Christ. It is a means to an end, our perfection. Colossians 1.28. Once reconciled, God's purpose is for us to become transformed into the image of Christ. This is why believers are said to be especially saved, 1 Timothy 4.10, 
since they are presently submitting to God who is working salvation in them. Ezekiel 36.27, Ephesians 2.10, Ephesians 3.20, Philippians 1.6, 2.13, and John 15.5. Salvation goes beyond deliverance from temporal things and from God's passionate displeasure and judgment to actual deliverance from our sinful nature. Our perfection is the goal. See Romans 6, 3 and 4, 11 and 12, 8, 29, Galatians 4, 19, Philippians 2, 12 through 13, Colossians 1, 27 and 28, 2 Timothy 2, 11 through 13, Titus 2, 14, Titus 3, 8, James 1, 27, 1 John 3, 3, 1 John 4, 17. Attaining the fullness of salvation, our perfection in Christ, comes only through the cross working in our lives. God forbid that I should boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Galatians 6.14 It is only through dying to ourselves, suffering, and trials that we are able to develop spiritually. Matthew 16.24 John 12.24 Romans 5.3-5 Romans 6, 6, 2 Corinthians 12, 9 and 10, Galatians 2, 20, James 1, 2 through 4, 1 Peter 1, 6 through 7, and 2, 21. Though sufferings and trials, our cross, are not redemptive, only the blood of Christ is, they are nevertheless essential to our training. Either we take up our cross willingly, or God will lay it on us in his own time. For the way of the cross is the only path to our full salvation, to a perfect man. Ephesians 4.13 There are no shortcuts. Even Christ learned obedience by the things which he suffered. Hebrews 5.8 The disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone who is perfectly trained will be like his teacher. Luke 6.40 We must all be perfectly trained. Believers have been given the opportunity to live a godly and selfless lifestyle in this age, i.e., crucifying themselves daily in the steps of Christ. Unbelievers will have their opportunity in the coming age or ages, as God brings the cross upon them through purposeful judgment. Why faith, then? What is its purpose? What does it mean to believe in the name of Jesus for salvation? Acts 4.12, Philippians 2.9-11 Faith is trusting in God's person, His nature, character, and ways, being fully assured that what He promises, He can and will do. Romans 4.21 It is not a religious formula, but childlike trust in the true God. Mark 10.15 Faith opens the channels of God's blessings into our lives. As we trust Him, we begin to know His peace and subsequently yield to His Spirit working in us. Many think that because they have faith, they are cut above the rest. Not so. Faith is God's gift and work in us. Hebrew and Greek scholar Dr. Michael Jones says that the gift referred to in Ephesians 2.8 clearly and unmistakably refers back to both salvation and faith in the Greek. This is confirmed by Hebrews 12.2, Jesus, author and finisher of our faith. Hebrews 12.2 The following, I believe, will confirm this. Matthew 11.27, 16.16-17, John 1.13, John 6.44, John 15.16, Acts 13.48, Romans 10.17, Romans 12.3, 1 Corinthians 4.7, Philippians 1.6, Philippians 1.29, Philippians 2.13, Colossians 1.12, 1 Timothy 1.14, Ezekiel 36.26-27, Jeremiah 24.7, Jeremiah 31, 33 and 34, Jeremiah 32, 39-40. Some even scorn the thought that unbelievers may be able to trust Christ beyond this life. How sad. Of course they'll believe then, they say. It will all be too obvious. There will be no merit to that. Merit? Since when is faith meritorious? Where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what law? Of works? 
No, but by the law of faith. Romans 3.27 Why must faith only be valid in this life? Can trusting God ever become obsolete? And what if faith were limited to this life? Would that paralyze an almighty, all-loving God from restoring life to whom He wants, when He wants, and where He wants? Judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. James 2.13 If judgment is without mercy to the merciless, it is with mercy to the merciful. But that does not exclude Him from doing it on His terms and for our correction. Proverbs 3.11-12 Remember, He is a loving Father to all. We need to recognize that God integrates both mercy and judgment. This factor is a crucial piece of the puzzle, helping us to better understand God's plan for all. By applying mercy together with judgment, He accomplishes what is good and just in all our lives. Charles Pridgen, president and founder of the Pittsburgh Bible Institute, argues there is an erroneous idea that when one accepts forgiveness of his sins, he thereby escapes all the consequences of his sins. This is by no means the case, as everyone may know by experience. The consequences last until there is no longer need of their warning and judging lesson. Is it any wonder myriads of Christian denominations fiercely adhere to conflicting tenets? Let us humble ourselves before God's power and wisdom and accept that He is infinitely greater than we can imagine. Ephesians 3.20 Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God! How unsearchable are His judgments and His ways past finding out! Romans 11.33 For we know in part, for now we see in a mirror dimly. Now I know in part. 1 Corinthians 13, 9 through 12. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, be glory. Ephesians 3, 20. In order to appreciate the vital role of God's just and righteous judgments in his unfailing plan for all, we must understand salvation's depth and purpose, the grand scope of what it encompasses salvation's relationship to faith and the cross, and recognize that God integrates pardon with chastisement. Failure to recognize any of these vital elements will compromise our ability to find harmony within the Scriptures and grasp the awesome majesty of God. Thoughts and Prayers Ephesians 3.20 states God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all we ask or think. Do we believe it? Can we dare believe, hope, and pray for something this grand and wonderful? That God can and will accomplish all His will for humanity? Is His hand so short it cannot redeem all people? Isaiah 50, verse 2. Is the redemption of all not good and acceptable to Him? 1 Timothy 2, 3. John Wesley believed that God can convert a world as easily as one individual. Was he mistaken? The Apostle Paul wrote, I exhort that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved. Christ Jesus gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. I will, therefore, that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without doubting. 1 Timothy 2, 1-6 through and verse 8. King James Version. See also Mark eleven twenty two to twenty four, Romans four twenty, and James one six through eight. Does God not call us to pray and thank Him for the salvation of all, and to do so without doubting? Is He not willing and able? If we err by praying in such a lofty way, would this dishonor or displease Him? Our only sin would be taking His word to heart. If I am to err, let it be for expecting too much of God, not too little. Let us dare to think and believe the very highest thoughts of God. What can be higher than thanking Him for the salvation of all people? Scope of the Gospel Scripture, foreseeing God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel to Abraham beforehand, saying, In you 
all the nations shall be blessed. Galatians 3.8 The gospel is defined in eight simple words. In you, all the nations shall be blessed. These words are the very gospel Paul preached, justification by faith. This gospel was first revealed to Abraham and is repeated five times in Genesis. Genesis 12.3, 18.18, 22.18, 26.4, and 28.14. God did not want us to miss it. Notice, it does not say some nations, but all. The important question in all this is, does the term nations include every person? Peter makes it clear. In your seed, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. To you first, God, having raised up his servant Jesus, sent him to bless you in turning away every one of you from your iniquities. Acts 3, 25 and 26. According to Peter, the blessing of all nations includes all the families of the earth, but he does not stop there. He goes on specifying that the blessing includes every member of the family. Notice his words, every one of you. For years as a missionary, I have heard and read that God was merely interested in a token representative from every nation, tribe, and tongue. That has always troubled and perplexed me. As I look at Scripture more closely, I see a totally different picture of God. Let's look at this passage again. In your seed, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. To you first, God, having raised up his servant Jesus, sent him to bless you in turning away every one of you from your iniquities. Acts 3, 25 and 26. Acts 3, 25 and 26 establishes four critical points. The gospel comes to the elect first, not exclusively. And in due time, it will bless every one of your family members, regardless of what you think their present spiritual state is. What is the blessing? It is turning away from sin. It is the same gospel Paul preached, justification by faith. This is established in Galatians 3.8 via God's promise to Abraham, Genesis 12.3, and repeated here, Acts 3.25. It confirms that justification by faith, as marvelous as it is, is not an end in itself. It is the prerequisite to turning from sin, the working out of our salvation. Think about the term family. What does it mean to be a member of a family? It means one is part of a cohesive whole. If one is hurting, all are hurting. It can be accurately compared to the body of Christ. We are members individually, and the members should have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all the members suffer with him or her. See 1 Corinthians 12, 25-27. Now ponder this. How can these blessed ones, spoken of by Peter in the above passage, all individual members of families, experience the great joy of the gospel? Luke 2.10, Romans 10.15. If they are vexed and tormented over the destiny of any of their lost family members. Could you greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible? 1 Peter 1.8, New American Standard. Knowing that your son daughter, dad, mom, wife, or husband are suffering in an eternal hell. If we do not provide love and care for our own household, we have denied the faith and are worse than unbelievers. 1 Timothy 5.8 We must love our family members and neighbors as ourselves. Romans 13.8-9 If we so loved in truth... We could not have peace and joy unless we knew all our loved ones were eternally safe. This simple truth alone confirms the unlimited scope of the good news. Paid in full. One of the last things Christ said while hanging on the cross was, Father, forgive them. Luke 23, 34. Did God not answer his prayer? In John's Gospel, his last recorded words were, It is finished. John 19.30, which the Bible Knowledge Commentary says means paid in full. What is the significance of this? Consider the commentary John provides on Christ's redemption. What better commentary could we have than the author? He says, Behold, 
the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John 1.29 He himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. 1 John 2.2 2. The sins of the whole world have been paid in full. I would not dare place any limitation on the power of the blood of Christ to save all for whom it was shed. The world. Perhaps no passages are more precious and essential than these. I entreat you to prayerfully meditate on each one. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John 1.29 The world. It is finished. John 19.30 Paid in full. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. 1 John 2, 2. The world. The Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Isaiah 53, 6. Everyone. My flesh I give for the life of the world. John 6:51. The world. Christ died for the ungodly. Romans 5, 6. That includes everyone. When we were enemies, we were reconciled through his death. Romans 5.10 If you and I, why not all? Justification to all men. Romans 5.18, New American Standard. All men. If one died for all, then all died. 2 Corinthians 5.14 His death affects all. For it pleased the Father by him to reconcile all things to himself through the blood of his cross. Colossians 1, 19 and 20. All. He tasted death for everyone. Hebrews 2, 9. Everyone. Christ suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust. 1 Peter 3, 18. Everyone. He gave himself a ransom for all, to be testified in due time. 1 Timothy 2.6 Everyone. Christ gave himself a ransom for all, 1 Timothy 2.6, and not merely some. He propitiated not only our sins, but also those of the whole world, 1 John 2.2. 2. That includes the ungodly, Romans 5.6, the unjust, 1 Peter 3.18, and even his enemies, Romans 5.8. In fact, everyone. Hebrews 2.9 The ransom for their sins has been paid in full. John 19.30 Thus, all are reconciled through his blood. Colossians 1.20 I accept these passages as they read. Moreover, because I do, I am confident that God will reveal himself to all men in his ordered due time. 1 Timothy 2.6 What paid in full implies... Christ did not suffer in vain for anyone. Sooner or later, all will come to faith and obedience. All are washed in the blood, and I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw, drag all men to myself. John 12.32 RSV Why is all coming to faith so hard to believe in light of what Scripture teaches about Christ's death and God's power? Just think of your own faith and obedience. You are blessed enough to experience it in this age, perhaps in your youth or later in life. In either case, it happened. To whom do you give credit for your faith and obedience? Do you credit yourself for being lucky enough to have been at the right place at the right time? Or wise enough to have seen the opportunity and seized it? Luke 10.21, 1 Corinthians 1.26-31 Or righteous enough to carry your cross and remain faithful to the end? If you do not credit yourself, then you must credit another, Christ and his paid-in-full redemption. So then, I will assume you do not credit yourself, but Christ for your salvation. Do you believe you are saved while most of the human race is going to hell forever? If so, think carefully what this means. It means God has arbitrarily selected you over others, or that he finds you more worthy than others, or both. But this denies that Christ has paid in full sin's debt. It denies that God is impartial and fair with every person on earth. It denies that Christ accomplished his mission. John 17.4 and 12.47 It means the Father's will and purpose to save all is forever 
denied. It means his love is not without end. 1 Corinthians 13.8 Do you see the contradiction in all this? This is very serious. But I have good news for you. There is a biblical solution to your dilemma. That solution is understanding God's purposes in election. The burden of our Lord's heart was for the whole world, and that our oneness is essential to our witness. Education, wisdom, and status are not the prerequisites for spiritual revelation. We must be as babes before Him. We are called to judge for ourselves what is right, and to face the question of questions. How can a good God create people He knows will be tormented forever? The two major Christian theologies were contrasted with each other. Each magnifies a key attribute of God, His love or His power. The blessed hope was shown to glorify God in both of these attributes. Could this be the key to Christian unity and world witness? Veiled from the traditional paradigms is the salvation of all and the integration of both pardon and chastisement. The wondrous scope of salvation was traced to God's promise to Abraham, confirmed by Peter and Paul, and ultimately by Christ on the cross, as the sins of the whole world were paid in full. We start with Christ facing the cross with the world on his heart, and close with his very last words while suspended between heaven and earth. Father, forgive them. It is finished. Such forgiveness confirms the blessed hope.